I'm Lisa Yuzda, News 1130's legislative reporter. We're continuing our FaceTime conversations with BC's political leaders. Now we have leader of the BC Liberals, Andrew Wilkinson. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Lisa. So we're going to start with, right, and jump right in with a question that caused a lot of controversy after the debate. A little conversation about racism. We go to Bowen from Omni. If you elected, how will you deal with systemic racism? How will you protect the Chinese community from racism? This is a very important to say there are six different entries in our platform that deal with this issue. We have called for anti-racism training throughout the provincial government, and that, of course, includes all the elected officials, because we need to make sure that all British Columbians feel like they are fully valued and respected in our society. I grew up with what I recognized to be white privilege. I became aware of that when I was about 12 years old, and have ever since then been concerned that people who are racialized can feel that they are fully engaged in British Columbia and Canadian society, and that they are not somehow uh, relegated to a secondary status after white people. It's something that I feel very strongly. And looking at people who are coming here from other countries who want to be full participants in Canada, uh, a question here from Arvin at Omni about how we can get people working here faster in the careers they're specialized in. If elected, what can your government do to increase the participation of immigrants who are licensed professionals in their home countries? Actually, this is another point that we have. You know, I went through medical training and in Canada and became licensed as a doctor and worked with doctors who had trained in other countries. And so what we have said, given the pandemic scenario and the need for more healthcare professionals, we need to accelerate the acceptance and integration of health professionals trained in other countries. Not just doctors, it's also nurses and other uh, health professionals. There's time to move ahead on this. The uh, engineering profession has actually done a better job than most professions because they have a fairly effective evaluation system and they manage to process hundreds and hundreds of applicants with degrees from other countries on an annual basis. We can do it in other fields just like they do it in engineering. And looking at the sort of bouncing off those topics, looking at what we are doing to combat racism in our society, we go to Isabel with City News. Many people voiced their disappointment with the answers given Tuesday when it came to racism. One UBC expert said it's not enough that our government leaders uh, say that they are not racist, they need to be anti-racist. So we want to know what are some concrete ways that you and your government are going to be anti-racist? Again, this is a very important question. We put right on our platform that there would be anti-racism training for everybody who works for the provincial government. That's about 35,000 people, includes all the elected officials. And in the extended pool of people who work for government, that extends out for about 200,000 healthcare workers. And we've heard recently about racist incidents that are alleged to have occurred in emergency rooms. That needs to be addressed. And that anti-racism training is something that we will uh, proceed with as soon as we form government. So if you're in government, how soon? I hear what your plan is for what you want to do, but how soon would people see tangible uh, effects of that in, in their daily lives? Well, there'd be a fairly quick process of saying, who are the right folks to engage to uh, teach us what kind of training needs to take place? What's effective? We don't want this to be window dressing. We don't want this to be, let's watch a video for half an hour and we're done. It has to be more substantive than that, because when you think about it, the provincial government touches many people's lives whether it's provincial prisons or the judicial system or the healthcare system, these are primary interfaces for citizens of BC with the services they're entitled to. We have to make sure that those are not subject to racism. So the question is entirely appropriate, and that's why we put it in the platform as a very explicit statement of what we would do. And Andrew, what have you done as far as anti-racist training you and of course your, your cabinet and, and, and your caucus? You know, I can't say that I was ever put through anti-racism training, and that's one of those things that occurs to you in life after the fact to think, maybe that would have been a good idea. My own experience was figuring out about age 12 that I was treated differently than other people. I remember the classroom in high school at age 14, where I kind of figured out that I was being treated differently than other students in the class, particularly uh, an Indigenous uh, student. 
And so it's the kind of thing that builds up in you and you think, well, if we're going to have a society that's fair for everybody that I'm very committed to, a society that provides opportunity for everybody regardless of who they are, you have to address these issues of systemic racism. Otherwise, we just carry on with the past and pretend it's not happening. And that's not good enough. You've talked a lot about trust with John Horgan. So if you're saying that this is such an important issue that you've put on your platform, but you haven't done the training yourself, how are people supposed to trust that you're going to do it? I've never been offered the training. You know, I've had a number of roles in my life and in the hospital system, it never came up, although there was no shortage of issues that should have been addressed there at an incremental level. The idea of actual um, solid anti-racism training is a more recent thing. And, you know, in the legal profession, it didn't come up. There was some uh, conversation about it, but nothing substantive. And then in government, whether in the civil service or as an elected official, it has never been offered. And so I just say, you're the leader, though, right now. So, you know, you're in charge of, of enforcing what you're, you and, and your uh, MLAs do. Well, I've been the leader now for about two years, and this has been a key theme for me. We don't have the wherewithal as a caucus to put together anti-racism training. We have no budget. And so the issue becomes, if you were able to form government, what would you do? And that's why we put it exactly in the platform to say it's high time that all 35,000 people in the provincial government got that training. And it can also be set up to uh, follow through with the two or 300,000 people who are indirect employees of the provincial government. And we're moving on now to the pandemic, and gosh knows we can't wait for it to be over. And we go to a question from Travis at City News. Many British Columbians are waiting with bated breath for a COVID vaccine. If and when a vaccine is developed, how will you ensure people in all corners of the province get quick access to it? I was actually just reading yesterday a, a paper called Vaccine Equity. And it talks about this huge challenge of making sure that it isn't just the richest places or the places that have uh, vaccine production facilities that get first uh, access to the vaccine. It's got to be based on appropriate need. So when you come to British Columbia, we're hoping to get an abundant supply of vaccine when it comes. And remember, there are going to be a number of different vaccines that come on the market. We'll have to find out the most effective vaccine for different population groups and make sure the people who are most exposed get it first probably starting with healthcare workers. It may also be people who are living in long-term care facilities and then working out from there. So we have to turn to the experts in public health like Dr. Henry and also have a very honest conversation about the ethics of all of this. Because our goal, of course, is to have all 5 million British Columbians receive the, the vaccine. Some of them will decline it, and that's their choice. But we've got to have an effective vaccine program that reaches throughout British Columbia. You can't just say that only a select few will get it. That's not fair within a community, not fair within a province, it's not fair across Canada, and it's certainly not fair around the world. And we, of course, have the COVID crisis, and we have another crisis. We go to David Zura with City News about, with a question about the other crisis. BC's other pandemic is the opioid crisis. More than 5,000 people have died from an illicit drug overdose in this province since the public health emergency was declared in 2016. It's a problem hitting every corner of our society, from people on the street to people dying in their own homes. And the monthly death toll numbers just came to seep getting worse. What will your party do to bring the overdose crisis under control? This is critically important, and my medical training helps a lot. 49 American states have a prescription monitoring program so that when someone goes to the doctor and receives narcotics for a temporary condition, the monitoring programs make sure they don't carry on indefinitely. They refer them to specialist care, they provide them with the necessary um, means to get off medications before addictions become an issue. That's step number one. Step number two is to provide a program for a pathway for people to get off drugs. It's not good enough just to leave people on uh, drug addiction programs for the rest of their lives. These are human beings. These are people with addictions. And our goal has to be to get as many of them as possible off drugs. There's also the phenomenon we need to recognize that a, about two-thirds of these deaths are men between about 18 and 55, often dying in their own home alone. So we've got to make sure we've got programs that can address that as well, hopefully by prevention, like the prescription monitoring programs, or by treatment programs, like what I've just discussed. Because simply keeping it going indefinitely is not a solution. It's just a Band-Aid. 
And one of the outcomes of mental health issues, including addiction, is people not having places to live. You've talked about your plans for homeless. One of the issues I think that catches people's ears and they wonder how it's going to work, as you say, you know, to ban people being able to camp in parks. Well, that's people's homes right now. So how in the immediate would you deal with people who don't have homes and who are dealing with addiction issues and other issues? Yeah, we've said very clearly from the start of this campaign, you've got to treat the causes, and there's more than one cause, and prevent the harm. And the causes of addiction, the causes of homelessness are many. You just have to look around the streets and realize that some of these people have severe mental illness, like schizophrenia. Some of them just run out of money, like the people who are sleeping in the park near my house. Some of them are people with brain injuries from either prior overdoses or from trauma. And these are people who need to have care addressed specifically for the cause of their disorder. That way, you can actually start to manage the homelessness problem with a goal of helping them through their health challenges and getting them settled in life. For some people, like the people sleeping in the park near my house, the answer is probably they just need a bit more money. They need a rent supplement to get settled again and get themselves established in life. For someone with mental illness, they need to have treatment for that disorder because you can't expect them to just get better by putting them in a, a rundown motel like the NDP have. So there's a thoughtful, compassionate approach to this, or there's the bulk warehouse approach of the NDP, which has been a complete failure in Vancouver, Victoria, and Nanaimo, and various other places around the province. You can't just scoop people off the street and warehouse them and expect success. That's a direct quote from an NDP cabinet minister. She's right about that. We need to do better. And, but what you're talking about is a longer term solution and you have criticized people being moved into hotels in different areas of the province and you have criticized the camps being allowed to exist. So if you're elected, if on October 24th you get a mandate, what do you do for the next couple of months, month to get people out of these tent cities and out of hotels? What do you do? First of all, you recognize that living in a tent is not a treatment for schizophrenia. Living in a tent doesn't address your brain injury. Living in a tent doesn't provide you with a bit but, of cash to get. I'm going to interrupt here because I think we we're, we're clear on that. We're clear that that is not a life that we want people to live. That we don't want our loved ones to live. What are you going to do to get them out of there? Is there going to be? Are you going to have magical treatment beds that open up? You know, a week after the election. Well, we have to treat this as a health emergency, just like we treat the pandemic as a health emergency, because we're going into winter. This is a winter where COVID will be spread more actively because, like other respiratory illnesses, it happens more when people are in confined spaces. In the summer, the spread of disease is more limited because people are outside. So we're coming into the danger zone in COVID, and we've got to find a way to house these folks. That's going to require temporary housing, but you don't just do it as a bulk discount thing like the NDP. Treat everybody the same and just put them in a box. You talk to them as a human being and find out exactly what's going on with them and offer them solutions. That can be anything from hotels to community facilities to student residences. All kinds of solutions are available, but we've got to get creative and we've got to address the causes of the problem, not just say one size fits all, which is what the NDP have done and it doesn't work. So we'll move on from where people live to how they get around. We have a question from News 1130, Sonia, about infrastructure. Many Metro Vancouverites have no choice but to commute every day. We don't have a replacement for the Massey Tunnel. The new Patello Bridge is still years away. And the idea of a third North Shore crossing seems like a dream. So what is your plan to give commuters more options and to be more proactive about infrastructure projects? We've said very clearly that it's time to clear up the worst traffic bottleneck in Western Canada, the Massey Tunnel. That bridge construction can start immediately because it's a previously approved project that was cancelled by the NDP, causing increased costs and massive delays. So let's get creative and let's get going on these projects to relieve these traffic bottlenecks. We're completely committed to transit. The expansion of transit in Surrey is long overdue and we'll be supporting that. We've also talked about the need to expand the rapid bus network, like the one that goes uh, on an avenue a few blocks from my house now that's new in the last year. It works and it's effective and it happens quickly. It takes time to build things like SkyTrain, but we can get rapid bus networks going much faster and that's got to be our goal. John Horgan talked about sending the SkyTrain all the way out to Langley. Would you support that or do you think for the time being that would be, as you said, with rapid buses? 
We've said all of the existing infrastructure programs, including the SkyTrain expansion, Surrey, will continue. In addition to that, we've dedicated an extra $8 billion in the next three years for things like the Massey Tunnel replacement, because we've got to get BC going again. I think it's fair to say that we've got to make sure people have access to affordable daycare. They've got to have some financing for tourism industries to keep them going over the winter. And we've got to make sure people can actually get around. And transit's going to be a challenge until there's a vaccine. We all know that because you can't have the density of people like we used to have when I rode the Canada line for five years back and forth to work. So it's the kind of thing where we've got to get really focused on this as a priority and make sure we're addressing all the possibilities, starting with rapid buses and starting with the construction of the Massey Tunnel replacement. And another question about we go from transit to taxis, we go to Amrit from Omni. The taxi and trucking industries in which South Asian voters are heavily involved in say that their livelihoods have been negatively affected. If elected, how will the Liberal government make a fair playing field a mandate? Two things there. First of all, in trucking, we're the only party to put it actually in our platform to say that there needs to be a review of the trucking parking situation and the trucking brokerage system to make sure it's actually working in the best interests of British Columbians and particularly the people involved in the trucking industry. On the issue of taxis, we've seen the NDP take a, a very deceptive approach with the taxi industry. They strung them along for two and a half years and then just sprung a surprise on them by saying, suddenly we're going to have ride hailing and that's too bad. There needs to be a level playing field. We can address insurance issues in the taxi industry, which are a big cost for them, by introducing competition. Right now they have no choice but to go to ICBC. And there is no good reason why we can't allow competition for taxi insurance. It'll be a huge assistance to them for things like insurance only when the vehicle is in use. That's entirely possible in today's technology systems, and it would be a huge saving for the taxi industry. So we're interested in making things better for the taxi industry by the, making sure there's a level playing field, unlike the NDP who chattered about it for two years and then completely double-crossed the taxi industry. And one last question about how we get around. We'll go to Travis with City News. As COVID-19 forced British Columbians to go on staycations this year, many have realized traveling with BC Ferries is not cheap. How will you ensure BC Ferries doesn't increase its rates even further to cover losses from the pandemic? Yeah, the pandemic has been a huge challenge on BC Ferries, and I think most of us remember back in March and April, it was a skeleton service because nobody was traveling anywhere. It's now back to a more regulated service, and we all have heard about the issues with the, the uh, transportation board federally and whether people are allowed to stay in their cars on the decks because the federal government didn't want that to happen. But people are very careful about what they're doing up on the passenger decks. So the capacity of BC ferries, just like it is for transit, has been reduced. We can't let BC ferries founder because they just don't have the passengers. We have to make sure that BC ferries is ready to serve the full complement of passengers in an affordable way after the pandemic. And this is the kind of thing where we've talked about we've got to be sure that we're not cutting services through the pandemic and have a shell of our society left after the pandemic. We have to support government programs through the pandemic to make sure we can all recover and move ahead once we have the vaccine and once people are in a healthy state again. Part of the reason we're doing this, Andrew, is we want people to be able to get to know the leaders a little bit more. So a simple one here. What do you watch? What's your net, Netflix and chill to, you know, to relax with all this pandemic? Oh, it depends who I'm with. If I'm with my wife, it's The Crown, and I got there's a new season out. <laughs> I used to be Downton Abbey, and that got a little uh, hard to handle after a few seasons. <laughs> And what do you watch by kid. yourself? When you're by yourself, what do you watch? Oh, my current one is the um, the CIA spy Jack Ryan series on Prime. That's the one that I watch alone because nobody else wants to watch it. And then with my kids, to my surprise, they're often watching reruns of Modern Family, which I am not into at all. Oh, that one makes me howl, Andrew. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, watching Modern Family episode number 378 does not make me howl. It makes me cringe. Okay, well, let's end off with may, what may be difficult, maybe an easy question in the effort of cooperation and kindness. Can you say one kind thing, one thing you like, one thing you respect about your two counterparts with the Greens and the NDP? Both of the, my counterparts, Sonia Firstenau of the Green Party and, and John Horgan of the NDP, are committed to their 
their cause, to what they believe in. They work hard at it, and they've dedicated a good chunk of their lives to it. Sonia, in particular, approaches this with a great deal of integrity. She's someone who's doing this for all the right reasons. And I get along very well with Sonia because we take the same approach to public service. We're doing this to make BC better for everyone. Mr. Horgan has a different perspective on British Columbia, where we need to go, and that's why he and I disagree on a few things, particularly in that he put out this document for his, his uh, candidates co with columns describing us and them, the good people and the bad people. I don't believe in that. I believe we have to serve everybody in British Columbia. We've got to make British Columbia better for everyone who lives here. That's why you go into public service, not to create friends and enemies, not to choose winners and losers, but make BC successful for just about everybody who can participate in our society. Well, a little bit backhanded there, but thank you for your time, Andrew. I do appreciate it. That's BC Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson. I'm Lisa Yuzda, News 1130's legislative reporter. And that's our latest of the leaders, our FaceTime with the leaders.